Hi, I'm David Allen Lambert. I'm here with Terry O'Connell, and we are your virtual historians. And another exciting episode. We're glad you tuned in. We have Jeff Aronowitz, and he is from Virtuify Consulting. It works with education in virtual reality, and I think that's right up our alley, and hopefully yours too. So, Jeff, welcome. Thank you, uh, Terry and David. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's one of those things that I think virtual reality is going forward in giving us so much of a better understanding of history. And for me, I love Virginia, colonial Virginia, but more so Jamestown. And a mutual friend of ours, Michelle, who's an archaeologist, told us about you. And you've had some really exciting work with Jamestown and with 3D printing and so the entire experience sounds fascinating. Can you give us a little background on how you got involved in that? Yeah, sure. When I started at Jamestown, it's an active archaeological site. It's an incredibly exciting place to be. And there's constantly artifacts coming out of the ground. And a lot of those artifacts are not going to be uh, accessible to the public to touch, to hold. And that they go back in a collection, and it's an incredible collection. But in order to make it a little more accessible... You can use technology such as 3D scanning, which can then create a 3D representation of the object that can be 3D printed. And then you can basically use that as a reproduction artifact to use with the public. So we had someone at VCU at the Virtual Curation Lab by the name of uh, Dr. Bernard Means, who was coming onto site and he was scanning these objects. And one of the first things I you know, was intrigued by was, could we use this for education? Interestingly enough, I was looking into it, I was pursuing it on the side, I was, and about, I think about a week later after I got into it, the Smithsonian started talking about, and more emphatically about their 3D scanning initiative, and they come to find out there's this guy in our lab who's been doing it, and I'm like, what in the world? This is perfect. Like, So I started <laughs> talking to them, and uh, we kind of collaborated on strategically deciding which objects from the collection could be used for their interpretive value. What I mean by interpretive value is they really have a story. They really have something uh, to tell. Example would be something like a small arrow point that was found in the leg and the femur of one of the uh, skeletal remains that were found on site, and that basically demonstrating first contact. So you could hand that object to someone, say, what do you think it is, do your whole interpretive questioning, and then you start to talk about the first meeting between the English and the Virginia Indians, what that object really represented. A lot of objects in the collection had stories similar to that, and that was really kind of what the emphasis was, was to make this more accessible to the public using those methods. As far as where VR comes in, it really was just kind of a natural progression of going out to the site on a regular basis, watching the progression. Archaeology is, of course, a destructive process. So as you're documenting that, they were meticulous about documenting, but they were documenting for you know, research. They were documenting for kind of their purposes and not so much for kind of a more photo journalist journey for the layman public to you know, kind of join on if you will. So rather than just taking pictures, I started using the 360 capture technology that was coming out with smartphones and creating 360 photospheres, and then basically just showing people on my phone. And then I think it was about 2014 that Google Cardboard came out. It was natural just to take the phone, stick it in, and hand it to random strangers on the site, because that's normal, and just have them say, look at this, look at this, and see kind of what the reaction was. Were people enjoying it? Were they getting it? And what that was able to do is take people from behind the guard lines down into the actual site. And they were actually able to get a much closer view, um, and a more personal view of what the site and what those features actually look like to understand more the context of how they fit in. So taking those 3D prints beyond just kind of the explanation and then explaining it was found in that site right there, taking it down a lower level and then actually seeing the site, and they start to understand the value of archaeology, the meticulous nature of it and why it has to be that way. Right. I think too many times people think it's just one big shovel and a big sift. And it's dental tools. It's really meticulous work, and it's slow. And it's stop and start. I mean, weather doesn't always cooperate. How many times they've had to tarp over a site? Exactly. But for students, they want to say, where are the arrowheads? Where are the skulls? I mean, where where are the things that are making them ooh and ah? And I mean... I know having done archaeological digs with Mass Archaeological Society and with people and archaeologists over the years, it's that seed bead that could be a trade item or something that's found in the Native American site. 
or a piece of pottery that's completely out of context. Why is this here? Is it mm-hmm. a trade item? How many thousands of items were you able to 3D create and print? Well, it's not quite thousands. The, the process of 3D scanning and then the work that goes into cleaning up the scan, which again, uh, Bernard and his students uh, were doing, you know, those students were interns. And so the man hours available to do that, it was dozens more so. It was more around dozens that we were actually using for our purposes. I have a picture that just shows them all laid out on the table, the first batch, if you will, that showed the different objects we were using. And then as we identified kind of holes in the interpretive uh, story where we could maybe use an artifact to fill it in or to at least enhance it, that's kind of what happened. But now Bernard has actually scanned thousands of artifacts over. He's traveled, you know, all over the world globally and done different collections in a number of ways. But for Jamestown itself, it wouldn't even say a hundred total. And part of that has to do with access, part of that has to do with the time it takes. And then part of it just has to do with some objects can't be scanned, but they're too metallic, but they're too fragile. They may just not have features that will come through. They're just too finely detailed. And uh, you know, the 3D scanner we were using was about, let's see if it was about, I forget what the, the, the specifics were because it's been so long, but they weren't able to do, it was only down, able to do down to like, you know, a coin, but you're not necessarily going to get the actual inscription on the coin. Just it's not going to get quite to that detail. So yeah, we we scanned a lot of objects, but not quite thousands. It would be nice though. I'm sure. Well, with the technology with VR, with and correct me if I'm not knowledgeable on this mm-hmm. point, a 3D scan could that be something that could a VR headset could then actually see, and then you could hold it in a VR environment, kind of model it and turn it. Besides printing it off. Yeah. And so that it was interesting because the whole time we were doing the 3D scanning and 3D printing, you know, VR was just kind of starting with the Oculus, the original Oculus that was coming out of Kickstarter was just kind of making VR a lot more accessible to the public. You know, the, the most VR is being used in an academic setting. It's being used for research. And you're talking tens of thousands of dollars uh, worth of equipment. You're talking about very sophisticated methods to get everything to work. It wasn't really something that was accessible to the public. Yet at the same time, there was this low-level VR starting to come out using smartphones, using the accelerometer, using the gyroscope, using the uh, screens, the high refresh screens, and all that kind of stuff, to where you could start to do these low-level stereoscopes, essentially, this next-level stereos. And any imagery that could be kind of offset, you could you do that. And I immediately was like, well, that, that should be great. Well, Google's first demo actually was showcasing uh, these objects that had been scanned at a, and I forget which museum, but it was in the Pacific Northwest. And they were showing these objects. And I was immediately like, we have got to do this. We've got to get it in there. Wasn't a whole lot of excitement around it. Folks weren't exactly getting, like, they're like, 3 print, you can hold it. I'm like, yeah, but you can start to build with this and, you know, create a virtual exhibit or something like that, and, which was pretty, pretty ambitious at that time. But as the technology continued, you know, uh, you know, one of my favorite things to do with folks with VR is take them into Tilt Brush, which is a program that could work on really any VR headset that's out there right now. And the minute you start to draw things in the three-dimensional space, well, you also have the ability to import objects into that three-dimensional space. And you can manipulate them any way you want. So you could take uh, you know, a small object that's very hard to see the inscription and you can blow it up to massive size, have it the size of an entire wall and you can read it. Or the same thing is you can take something and you can build it out to scale. So you can actually take something very large and build it out to scale. So you can manipulate it and whatnot, but again, from a from an actual touching, there's not really that tactile component, which is where haptics come in. There's a lot of haptics technology being worked on where you would actually get a different haptic sensation, a different vibration when you touch something in that space. And that's everything from, you know, there's gloves they're working on. They're using, you know, electro, electro uh, pulses. There's things where there's actually different uh, motors that have different resistance that basically give that idea of the resistance when you touch it. Sure. A lot of different variations of technology for that. But the real value, really, from my standpoint, is the accessibility. Not everybody can go to that site. Not everybody can handle that object. Not everybody knows how to 3D print. Well, you can give them a three-dimensional view of something versus a two-dimensional view, and they're actually able to walk around the object. They're actually able to hold virtually and manipulate the object to different views. And they can see, and they kind of have a better interaction. And that's for two reasons. The first is, again, accessibility. The second is, that connection with the object. You know, the value of the object is the personal connection. And when you put it in their hand, virtually or otherwise, those 3D prints did that all the time. We did that with a butchered dog jaw 
that had, you know, the cuts that indicated it had been butchered. And when you feel those cuts with your hand, you really start to get an appreciation of what that means. Same, VR can't go quite to that level, but it can approach it and make it more accessible. I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, whoever would have thought that where we are right now, I mean, just in the time since I've got my Oculus, the technology, you don't even need the handsets. It's now you clip your fingers together yeah. and it, it knows the yeah. pointing by the headset. Yep. I mean, soon, the, you know, the whole VR headset could be this, you know, and the points could be on your glasses. You know, I guess the sky's the limit. I mean, Terry, I mean, what yeah. do you think with all this? I know you're taking a lot of it in. So I, I hate that. Some questions, so. I am. And it's funny, everything he said, he's answered so many of my questions I haven't mm -hmm. even asked yet. I noticed that yeah. as I'm looking down the list. Yeah, like, I go down, I get, sorry, I go on a rant sometimes. No, so that's great. Please stop me if you want me to, yeah. So my biggest question, because all of this is so cool, is I want to know how the public reacted when you first let it out, the whole VR set while you're there, mm -hmm. the 3D items, like. Yeah. So it started with the the tour, right? So we there's an arc, and again, I haven't been there in a while, but it's the most popular thing ever, so I can't imagine it's, it's gone away, but there's an archaeology tour. Um, and that takes you around the site and it talks about, you know, the current, current excavations, past excavations. And the past excavations are really where the challenge is, right? You're looking at a patch of ground. You're talking about all the cool stuff they found, all the cool features. It was really, you know, it was an abstract concept for a lot of folks. And it really was on the onus of you as the tour guide to make it come alive, which we could do. You know, we were excited. Everybody was excited. But to have that 3D printed object, we could pull it out of our bag and say, this is what they found. This is what they found. You could build up the mystery. You could really make a show of it, which mm -hmm. is, you know, storytelling, essentially. That's what you're doing on the tour. Well, then you mentioned earlier about the tarps over the site. You mentioned about, you know, the deconstructive nature, things go away. The ability when it's a rainy day and people could, you know, I could pull out my VR viewer out of my bag, which was at this point was a, you know, a very beat up piece of cardboard, my <laughs> old phone, because I wasn't using my new phone anymore. And like a piece of business card had folded up and would put on the where the forehead is because so many people's forehead had completely discolored the <laughs> cardboard. It's gross. Like you don't have to put your head. So it's like a makeshift health reasons or whatever. But you know, the minute they put that on, they're like, oh, this is what you're talking. Oh, this is because I could talk about it, but when they see it, it's a whole nother thing. Once we moved to the ed shed, the, the education shed, that's when it really became something a little bit more formal. Like we could basically know. This is going to be there for the public. We can talk about it. We can have different scenes. We get different points. We can really build like an interpretive story around this. And then once we got the Gear VR, which made it much, much, much easier to kind of have preset imagery, we could just swipe through right away. And we could actually connect it and project it onto a screen so people could see what other people are seeing, which is one of the biggest issues with VR is, you know, somebody's in a headset. It's not real exciting for the rest of the people except, you know, watching them make a fool of themselves. You know, you really want them to share in the experience. So that's where the screen came in. And yeah, I mean, the reaction was was amazing. You know, with the 3D prints, teachers, my favorite experiences were when history teachers would come in there and they would realize, you could see the light bulb go off because they're thinking the 3D printers in the science lab and the engineer, you know, that's what they use. I don't use that. I'm a history teacher. And then the minute they saw they could 3D print an uh, artifact, they just went crazy. They were like, I want these spot. We couldn't get them out. I want these files, you know, I want to print these out. And that was like an incredible moment to see. Uh, and then we would actually sometimes 3D scan people. So I want to do a demonstration of how 3D scanning works. And I would send them the file because I could send them that. And then they would learn how to use the 3D printer because of it, because they wanted to print out their kid or they wanted to print out, or the kid wanted to print themselves out. And it just kind of started on this whole new journey of, of how to incorporate these tools they thought were so alien to what their interest was. And they basically, you know, the STEM thing we always push all the time, the STEM, 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 it's naturally there. You just have to show the connection. So it was really exciting to see people react to it, but it was also very educational for me to see ways to present it in different ways and learn how to get people excited about it. it it's not really that hard once you show it right and you show people the way they can use it, the way it's gonna benefit them beyond the cool factor. Does that answer your question? It does. You know, it's yeah. funny because I have um, a cousin who recently got a 3D printer and he's been printing things. And I, I sit here and I go, I, I don't get it. I don't mm -hmm. get it. Yeah. But I get it. <laughs> yeah. I get yeah, it. It makes sense. 
and the thing with 3D printer too is, you know, there's these programs in VR where you can go in and you can do 3D modeling in the environment. So to teach someone to use CAD or even, you know, Tinkercad, which is like, you know, CAD for, for, for folks kind of learning, you know, that's a very, that's a learning, very steep learning curve. There's a lot of things that are going to go wrong. You put somebody into a 3D environment, give them a few geometric shapes and tell them they can manipulate them to make something. And if you can basically incorporate some kind of engine behind that to make sure they can't mess it up, it'll print, which is what uh, a few of these programs have done. That opens it up to a lot of different possibilities for folks. And, you know, a lot of times in history, we can kind of think about, you know, one to one, we want to do an exact replica and make sure it's accurate. But if you start to remove that and just say, what's your interpretation of the object? What's your interpretation of this? That's when you really get these amazing moments and see the creativity uh, that can come from understanding the context of what these objects mean to people as well. It's pretty tremendous. So what is Virtify up to these days? What are you working on with consulting? Have you been anything you can talk about that? Yeah, beyond yeah. Your yeah, as of late, it's been primarily geared toward environmental education. And, you know, when you talk about the abstract nature, and this is what my favorite things about VR is, you have three dimensions, but you also have that, you know, kind of fourth dimension. And I'm not a physicist or whatever by any means, of it, but you basically have time you can incorporate. And you can basically take that place in time, you can switch it with a slider and really transport people. So one of the projects I've recently been involved in was showing the James River at different points of history so people could understand the human impact on the river and what it really means. That was a collaboration between a lot of really great, passionate people that wanted to use this technology to make it more accessible again to folks that maybe can't come to the river, can't come to these educational programs, but they can put on a headset, go on YouTube, whatever it may be, and they can experience a really incredible 360 experience of seeing you know, sturgeon up close and these other flora and fauna that are in the river, but mm -hmm. watching how their populations change, how the river changes and the clarity and things like that, just based on these, these, these variables throughout time. Ideally, what we'd, we'd love to do is take that to the next level and incorporate, instead of it three degrees of freedom experience, making it a six off. So you can actually use your hands, you can actually interact with objects, or you can actually interact with variables, but that's a significantly steeper challenge that is met both by you know resources financial and otherwise but also the technicalities of that would, would be significantly more ambitious and then that's probably the most recent one i'm also looking at some augmented reality projects uh just really to kind of bring some historical mini events to life with uh some we'll say alcoholic distributors that but it's been a project on pending for a long long time but i'd like to get back to that i think there's some possibility there we yeah, and drink to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then I'd say the other thing is just really just being available. I have folks all the time reach out to me and with like a one-off project of how do I do this thing or or what can be done here. And you know, for me, it's fun. I mean, I, I love getting people excited about the technology. I love seeing what they do with the technology because I can tell you all day all the things I've done and all the things I think you could do. But when you start to tell me what you could do with it, that's when I'm really getting excited because you're thinking about the possibilities and you're adding a completely different viewpoint that can really take it to the next level, especially with educators, work with a lot of educators on that. That's great because then it reaches that next generation, which is the same reason we're doing virtual historians because history isn't just a book and it isn't right. visiting just a site. You can learn and experience on many levels. And the other thing we reach out to genealogists, we have a lot of colleagues and the idea that history and archeology span are so much in the context of the story of your ancestors, you really need right. to understand both yeah. as well as genealogy. And people are just looking at them, oh no, I don't have time for that. Well, you need to have time for that. And with technology, if we ignored say DNA, so many genealogists 10 years ago, I'm not gonna be involved in that. Now, oh, when can I get my cousin tested? So I think VR is really gonna reach out to people as they learn more about history. I mean, and hopefully, you know, as the world gets back to normal, <laughs> whatever no, a new normal is, they'll have already embraced some of that. I mean, we live in the Zoom world now. <laughs> I mean, I've truly been able to escape my introverted existence through virtual travel, learning history, just kind of being right. feeling enveloped in all of that. And I really, you know, I tip my hat to people like yourself who have actually made this 
you're really at the Orville and Wilbur right of that technology right now. It's really exciting. I mean, I think what, what's going to be like in five years, let alone 50 years, is amazing. But I was just going to say that, you know, my favorite thing to talk about is the progression of the technology. You know, 2016, we're talking about a $30,000, $40,000 rig at Stanford being used. And then a few years later, they're replacing it with a, you know, $400 headset and maybe a $4,000 computer or something like that, right? And then now we're at the point where you can buy an Oculus Quest 2 or, or 1 refurb for the same price. Well, the, the refurb one's the same price as the Oculus Go was when it came out. And the Oculus 2 is, you know, a few hundred dollars. And that technology is, is every bit as good as a PC VR headset of just a few years ago. There's a few you know, quibbles here and there as far as the graphic processing, but for most VR experiences, it is far beyond. And the thing that's really important is when you remove the wires and you make it a fully wireless experience, it just takes everything to that next level. The, you know, one fifth of Facebook's employees are working on VR right now. And that is, that is, a, that is huge. It's, it's AR, VR, all this stuff, but that's huge. Apple is working full blown on it. They just had a rumor come out to say they're working on a headset that's 150 grams mixed reality headsets. So, I mean, they're, all the big players are looking at this and understand it's not going away. But more importantly, the mobile technology and the advancement of mobile technology has made this cheap. It's made it continually improving and it's made it, accept, you know, I'll say this word a hundred times, accessible. It's all about accessibility. VR is not going to be anything unless people are in it and creating content. You know, contributing what made Facebook and Instagram and all these other platforms, YouTube, great was people contributing their content to it and it being a social platform. VR doesn't have that yet, but it will because once people start to realize they can contribute to that effort, they can take a picture, they can 3D scan something in the world using their iPhone, which you can do right now. You can 3D scan something with an iPhone Pro and you can pull that into a VR environment or an augmented reality environment. Once people start to adopt that as a normal you know, behavior, it's just gonna absolutely explode. And it's exciting to watch it happen really is you know i'm always excited about technology but i mean vr and history combined and what you've been talking about is great i really hope that you come back again because we want to know what rectify it and what you've been up to as yeah. you move on yeah. uh, so i hope this isn't visit one and only so <laughs> terry any other questions you might have i don't have a question but just as a comment i love the whole thing that um, you're doing with the river because mm -hmm. now you're not only taking history, you're adding science to it. Yeah. Like that's all a part of that family history too, right? Like when you sit back and look at it. So that's going to be amazing as well. Yeah, it's, it, 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 what's, what's unfortunate is we, we hit the launch just as the pandemic hit. So there, are, you know, there were all these events planned where it was going to kind of be showcased the public, given that first taste of, of it. Because a lot of folks are still doing Google Cardboard, which blows my mind, but I mean, there are still people excited. I was at a conference, you know, before pandemic, and there was a room of hundreds of people that were excited about Google Cardboard, and I'm sitting there with a Go in my pocket and a PC VR at home, and I'm like, what? Like, no one knows about this. No, it, it, it was unfortunate, but, you know, now that things, you know, start to return, we're, we're very excited about really pushing it hard. Some other projects that, uh, may be coming about archaeological related, actually specifically related archaeology that might be coming about as well, um, which may be visit too, who knows. But this one in particular was was real, real close to, you know, my heart. I remember the first ideas kind of being scattered around and then about three years later it actually come into life. And it was pretty amazing to see all the people, uh, the James uh, River Association and uh, Capital Interactive, the two partners kind of come together and uh, really make it come to life. We'll definitely keep us posted on all of that because you know we're going to be definitely interested. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I could actually, I could share you, uh, uh, after this, I could share the link uh, for the sign up if you want to be able to see it in a 60 form. But the hope is actually get it on the uh, Oculus. Mm -hmm. So you can just download it on the Oculus store at some point. We'll definitely want to check that yes, out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Well, Jeff, we really appreciate your flexibility in coming on the show, and we want to have you come back because obviously this is just the start of something brand new and uh, exciting, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be other exciting things that you and Virtify will be doing. And I just 
just can't wait. It's kind of like being right before the holidays, waiting for your gifts to show up with technology. So thank you very much. And for all that you already have done and what you're doing for educators and working to inform the public about what you're doing. And uh, we'll have your uh, contact information at the end so people can reach out to you. And uh, thanks again. All right. Great. All right. Take care. Take care. And now we'll catch you around another time. All right. Sounds good. All right.